Her vision was worsening. Understandably, she wasn't happy. I first uh, began wearing glasses when I was in college, and as the years progressed, my vision became worse. In probably about 2003, the doctor that I went to said, you, you've got cataracts forming. Donna mentioned what was happening to her eyesight to her 83-year-old father, who was still a practicing physician in Southern California. He told her to do what he did and have the crystal lens implanted. So she called Los Angeles eye surgeon Uday Devgan, who had treated her father. Yeah, Donna's a very typical crystal lens patient. She came in and saw me and she had mild to moderate cataracts. She could still see. She could eke out the letters to barely pass a driving test. But it wasn't enough functional vision for her to enjoy watching her new HDTV, enjoy reading a book, or drive at night. Everything went just beautifully. Donna had been wearing glasses and contacts since high school. At first, she couldn't imagine her world without spectacles and contacts. But since her crystal lens surgery, she's been happily learning to live without depending on glasses. <laughs> That's a good option. The crystal lens is a revolutionary technology that flexes like your eye's natural lens. The crystal lens often enables patients to see up close, far away, and everything in between. I love to cook, and when I, once I retired, you know, I wanted to take cooking lessons, and I wanted to try all kinds of recipes, and I also love to watch old movies. But the problem is, the TV is kind of across the kitchen, and I'm up close here working with my recipes, trying to figure out what I'm doing. So I would always have my glasses on a string around my neck so that when I wanted to see what was happening, I'd have to put the glasses on because I was nearsighted. And then when I was ready to go back to cooking, I'd have to take the glasses off. Oh, how fun it is now. I don't have to take anything off or put it back on. I can see close up, and I can immediately look up, and I can see the television in the distance. I have thoroughly been enjoying that the last few days. It's been wonderful. How does a patient know that Crystal Lens is right for them? The first thing you do is ask your doctor. Eye surgeons these days, like me, offer the full spectrum of vision correction surgery. So we still do LASIK, laser eye surgery for certain patients. For others, we implant a little contact lens. And for others, we do a cataract surgery. So the nice part is now the cataract surgery, when we do it, can offer all the identical benefits of the LASIK laser eye surgery at the same time. We tailor the specific surgery to the patient. How old is the patient? Do they have any, eye, what eye conditions do they have? Do they have cataracts? What are their needs for their vision? And we aim to give them the specific type of surgery that will meet all their expectations. Eye surgery can make a patient understandably a little anxious. Dr. Devgan discussed the ease of the surgery. Beautiful. When you think about someone doing eye surgery on you, it sounds a little intimidating. There's a little bit of a fear involved there, but it's easy. It's very easy. This is a procedure that has no needles, no stitches, there's zero drops of blood, and it's absolutely pain-free. And it's a quick procedure. It's usually less than 10 minutes. So it's no more difficult from the patient's perspective than LASIK. One nice part about our surgery is, for a cataract surgery, the patient's only involvement is they just need to relax. For Donna Gallagher, life since her crystal lens surgery has been, well, an eye-opener. No more glasses around her neck. She's spending more productive time in the kitchen, enjoying getting outdoors and walking her beloved dog. But you know what she is really excited about? It's the colors. I don't think I knew what I was missing was the problem. And, and I'm I, someone who loves color. When you look around my house, I, mean, I do color everywhere. And um, I didn't realize that I wasn't seeing the brilliance of, of the colors that were in not only my home but in the world. And the next morning when I got up and my bathroom is this blue and this white, I literally had to get the surgical glasses and put them on my eyes because I wasn't used to this brilliance that hit me. It was, it was so gorgeous. Now I'm used to it now and it's wonderful. Donna has dramatically improved vision that she hasn't enjoyed since she was a teenager. But there was one thing she wasn't ready for. The next morning when I got up after having my, my right eye done, which is my close-up lens, my nearsighted lens, totally destroyed me. 
because what did I see? I saw every single wrinkle on my face. The next day I had to go to my hairdresser. I saw every single pore on his face. I didn't know if I wanted to go around seeing people's pores on their faces. But now I'm in a position of like, okay, maybe we have to consider plastic surgery. It's not beyond the realm of possibility now. So that's a warning. My makeup. I am so embarrassed to think that that's what people were seeing when I was going out. Because my makeup, I realized, oh my gosh, look what you were doing to yourself all these years. So at least now, hopefully I'm a little better than I was, but I want to warn you, it's a shocker that first morning. That one, great. Good. One last drop. Okay. Dr. Devgan likes the fact that there are vision correction options for his baby boomer and senior citizen patients. In the 10 years since the first crystal lens was implanted in the United States, it has led the way in vision correction. One of the nice things in doing cataract surgery is that we can not only fix the cataract, but at the very same time, I can address any nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, whatever else ails your eye. So even people who've worn inch thick glasses their entire lives, after I do their cataract surgery, I can give them sharp vision for almost all activities without glasses. That was uh, very reassuring, wouldn't you agree? So please stay tuned. We'll be back after these messages and continue this discussion on cataracts. It's fun to be a good neighbor. So say hi to your new neighbors at the L.A. Zoo and bring Grandpa. They've got a walking buddy for him, too. They've expanded, so there's even more to see and do. Don't wonder who's here, because just for kicks, they've got birds on sticks. Whatever you do, make sure Mom and Dad come early, because they're certainly ready to say hi to you. And this invitation comes from your good neighbors here at the L.A. Zoo. Buddy, pull over! Pull to the right! Don't you know, red lights and sirens mean pull to the right! In an emergency, seconds count. So when you drive, pay attention, or else... Save it, buddy. The ball call. Hello and welcome back to The Empowered Patient. I'm here at the Hollywood Wellness Center uh, and I have a very special guest, Phoebe Sievers. How are you? Nice to see you oh, again. Thank you. So uh, I see that you're, you're staying active and exercising here, huh? Um, yes, I am. Um, quite a while ago I realized there was a big, uh, a long history of heart disease in my family and I just decided that I had to take some action. So I started walking, I started doing exercise, and then I discovered Tai Chi. And uh, first of all, it's a, it's a wonderful practice. Um, it helps bone density because you stand for an hour. It also helps high blood pressure, which I have. Wow. And um, I don't know, there are so many things it lubricates your joints. So this is wonderful. So you've been practicing Tai Chi. And with this, have you been seeing results? You said it helps with blood pressure. Have you noticed a change in your own blood pressure? Absolutely. Or? My blood pressure has gone down about five points. Oh, that's fantastic. And also, I had been on the borderline of osteoporosis. And it's much better. My bone density chest is better. So your bone density is improved, your blood pressure is improved, and this is all through staying physically active, physically fit. And for you, the core, tying it all together, is your Tai Chi. I think so. So <laughs> this is great. So you're thinking preventative. You're thinking what can you do to stay ahead of things. And uh, you're keeping those joints fluid and practicing your Tai Chi. And there was great, I, oh, I understand yes. that you were using this booklet here, Exercise and Physical Activity. Uh, this is a product of the National Institute of, on Aging and free and available. So for all of you uh, look, watching at home, it's free and available. So I understand you were using this booklet here. Yes. And uh, so tell me, what, what was it that you found helpful in this booklet? Well, I really found it very helpful in the sense that it teaches you, like I would like to do weights mm -hmm. 
and they have a wonderful section about it and they have pictures, they teach you exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And really, uh, I found the whole book just absolutely full of wonderful information. So that's great, and it even mentions the Tai Chi in there, it I does. believe, yeah? It does, Yeah. One more thing about Tai Chi, it sure. does uh, help your balance tremendously. Absolutely, so I think really a great take home message uh, for people watching at home. Uh, lots of benefits that you've found from Tai Chi. Uh, definitely a, a, a huge benefit in helping with balance, could, could really benefit a lot of people. Uh, falls are a serious concern. Uh, we want to prevent those. But more than anything, that you found something that works for you, and now you're building a program around that. And yes. you're always looking to add different things, but you have a core of something that works for you. Right. I think that's yes. very helpful. I think people look, uh, watching at home might think of ways they can incorporate exercise and physical activity uh, more prominently into their own lives. Exactly. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us. Thank it was you. wonderful having you here. Thank you. And it's great to see you staying active. Uh, exactly the kinds of things we're talking about on The Empowered Patient. Staying active, staying fit so that we can live longer, live better, take charge of our health. Please call us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we'd love to get these booklets out to you. You can call the number below. These are free and available to all of us. And uh, thank you for joining us on The Empowered Patient. See you next time. We're back with Dr. Uday Devgan, one of our area's finest ophthalmologists. And it's so amazing for me because I have been afraid of eye surgery for many years. You can tell I still wear glasses. I haven't done all of those corrective things. But the technology has really improved, hasn't it? It's changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. In fact, now it's hard to do modern-day cataract surgery without about a million dollars worth of equipment. I, I see this equipment scattered uh, around your office. It, it's almost intimidating, but that's not the patient's experience. No, the patient's it? experience is actually the opposite. It's actually mm -hmm. very simple and very easy. Mm -hmm. All our exams to measure the eye are done without even touching the eye. We literally just shine lights on your eye. Wow. During the surgery, the patient experience is very easy as well. The patient's relaxed. The eye's completely numb. The patients feel nothing. And, and this, this is in the office, right? Actually, we, do, we like to do the surgeries in a real surgery center. So we, oh, oh we, you do? We okay. do, because a lot of our senior patients do have other medical issues. I sure. always do it with an anesthesiologist. Right. In case the patient wants a little more sedation or a little less sedation, that can be fine-tuned. Mm -hmm. Then during the surgery, the only thing patients see is just, an, they say it's an interesting kaleidoscope of colors. Wow. And that's it. And literally about five minutes later, the surgery's done. There's so, no bandages? Or? There's no bandage. There's no eye patch even. If you wow. have an eye patch or a cover over the eye, that's not the modern day surgery that I do. Wow. So right after surgery, the eye looks normal. There's no patch or, or cover over the eye. And I expect you to be able to see the clock across the room within 10 minutes, wow. even if you previously had inch thick glasses. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like people's reaction uh, to this, the return of their sight has to be the most uh, gratifying thing in For sure. of your day. The best part of my day is the day after surgery, where I see all the patients who've had the surgery from the day before, uh -huh. and they're thrilled. Oh, of course. I'm smiling from ear to ear because the patients are smiling from ear to ear. Yes. We do one eye at a time, so we do one eye, and then a week or two later, we do the second eye. I see. And we can fine-tune this to exactly that patient's needs, so whatever their needs for the visions are, whether you need to have great razor-sharp distance vision because you're a pilot, or let's right. say you're an avid reader and you want to be able to read without glasses, we find you to that specific patient. You know, for so many seniors, it's really a question of, I want to see my grandchildren's photos again. For sure. Yeah. And I think that these days with the modern day surgery and the newer premium lenses, you can see it all. Fantastic. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, How do you measure uh, the correction that would be needed for, for this lens that, that replaces the, this cataract uh, lens? Very important uh, question. We take very detailed measurements here in the clinic before the surgery. Mm -hmm. I specifically order a custom lens for each patient. It's not just off the shelf, the same lens right. for everyone. So the lens I'll order for you will correct your farsightedness, your little bit of astigmatism, right. your need for your reading perfectly. And so we do that for each eye. So it's custom done in advance of the surgery. I see. Is, is it possible for a person to put this off too long that they really can put their vision at risk totally? Well, the most important thing for patients to remember is 
There's no rush to do surgery, but certainly don't put it off forever. The best indication is whether or not you should have surgery is your vision's not good enough for your activities. If you say, you know, I wish I could drive at night, but I can't. I wish I could read the newspaper better, but I can't. You should consider the surgery. If you're happy the way your current vision is, there's no rush to do it. Right. If you do put it off for a prolonged period of time, it can make the surgery more challenging and the recovery a little bit more difficult. I see. But, and, and what is a normal recovery? You said vision returns in about 10 minutes, but postoperatively, what would a patient expect? Well, like any surgery, it takes time to heal. Right. And the normal healing, healing period is just a couple of weeks. Wow. Patients start to see right after the surgery, mm -hmm. and the vision steadily improves over the next few weeks. Mm -hmm. And so patients are usually comfortable enough after one week to have surgery in the second eye. So even for my parents, I did the surgeries about one week apart. I see. I, yeah, I, can't, I can understand that. It's like, okay, let's see how you did, doctor. <laughs> one out of course. Time. The patients want that. Yes. And so even in the community, I've done surgery for a, a lot of my colleagues or their mm -hmm. families, the other eye surgeons' families. They do the same, one eye now and one in about a week. Well, on your screen right now, you will see how to contact uh, Dr. Devgan, and this is important. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of information on the Internet. Do you recommend patients uh, inform themselves before they actually come yes, visit? Yes, this is going to be one of the most important surgeries of your life. Spend the time and do some Internet homework. Right. Do some reading. This book's a nice start. Uh -huh. It's on Amazon. You can certainly get it. Right. Cataract Surgery. So a patient's guide, so you can just Google this, put it right in. You're also all over YouTube, I understand. Yeah, I have a lot of, well, my videos on YouTube are actually teaching videos, so I do mm -hmm. a lot of teaching for other surgeons to explain how to do right. the more difficult ca cataract cases. Now, but definitely, spend the time doing the research. Okay, do, do people need to watch their diet before the surgery, no, or, or just, they should be watching that anyway? It's your, everything is basically the same as normal. Mm -hmm. The surgery is, is no more difficult than a routine doctor's office visit. I'll be darned. I, it, it, this is so, it's so amazing to me. My mother was born with one eye. So in my family, and all, for virtually all my life, vision and caring for the eye was always the highest sure. priority. And now I see this has become routine. Can, it is ahead. routine. It is routine. But remember, <coughs> it's maybe routine for some people, but for you as a patient, this is critical. This yes. will change how you see. Make sure when you see a doctor, Spend a half an hour or even an hour with the surgeon before surgery. Yes, a surgery can be only five minutes, but it needs to be a surgery that makes you happy as a patient. Right, exactly. And, and, and don't be afraid to look up the qualifications of the person you're going to. I know when we were talking briefly before this interview got underway, I was just amazed because all the places you mentioned where you studied and where you did your internship and now where you teach, I'm going... Those are the best in the world. They are yeah. the best in the world. Yeah, well, I'm very fortunate. I've even traveled to 44 countries to teach surgery or do charity surgery missions. Outstanding. So it's a fun thing, but most important, be comfortable, take your time, ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and think before you act. Well, it, that, that's good advice in, in any circumstance. And uh, for the caregivers, or maybe a son or daughter who is concerned about their, their parents' vision, um, uh, how do you broach this subject to mom or dad? Is this when you see them squinting at the newspaper or going, what happened on the television screen? Exactly. So a good example is I had a patient very recently where the daughter brought him in and she says, I brought him in because he would complain that he couldn't see the scores on the TV. He likes to watch basketball. Uh -huh. And he didn't want to have anything done. But then I actually showed him pictures of my mom's surgery before and after and explained it would be just five minutes and that he'd be able to watch the show again. Wow. And, and motivation enough for many for sure. people. Outstanding. Doctor, thank you so much My for pleasure. taking time with us today. Uh, I feel better already. Uh, thank you one and all for watching Aging Well in L.A. And, and I hope for those of you who may need this surgery, give it a second thought. A lot of highly technical and, and a very personable help is available to you. We'll see you next time. Bye, Bye. now.
bulky item pickup? Call 311, the toll-free number for non-emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Illegal dumping? Call 311, the toll-free number for non-emergency services. 311, your one call to City Hall. Hi, this is Caratero Family. We are from East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights. You? You're watching Channel 35, our, our city, our channel! <laughs>
Thank you very much. Welcome to the Los Angeles City Council Chambers. This is a meeting of the Los Angeles City Council. Today is August the 3rd, 2011. Council meets three times per week on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. and all meetings are open to the public. For those of you who cannot make it to City Hall, the meetings are televised on Channel 35 or can be viewed by visiting our website. The meeting is now in session. City Clerk, would you please call the roll? Heller Cohn, Cardenas, England, or Wizar, Koretz, Kerkorian, LaBunch, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, West, and Zion Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum, Madam President. All right, what's the first item of business? Approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Cardenas moves, uh, Mr. Zion seconds. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Mr. Kerkorian moves, Mr. Cardenas seconds. Madam President, would you like to run through the agenda? Yes, let's do that. Items 1 through 6 are items noticed for a public hearing. Items 1 through 4 are hearing protests against proposed improvements and maintenance of lighting districts. Council should continue the hearings and present the ordinances on September 11, 2011. Members, any specials? Any specials? And there's no cards on any of those items? All right, let's open the roll. That's items 1 through 6. Madam President, uh, can we first vote on items 1 through 4? Members, any specials on items 1 through 4? All right, then let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Next item. Items five and six are hearing appeals against the annual confirmation of assessments for sidewalk maintenance districts. Council should close the public hearing and instruct the city engineer to proceed. Again, any cards? No, ma'am. No cards? Member, um, any specials members? No? Okay. All right, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Next item. Items 7 through 9 are items for which public hearings have been held. Items 7 and 8 are ordinances. Would you like to hold them on the desk until 12 I, members are I would are like present? to call item 8 special, and I will come out of the chair for that. Members, any other items? Okay, open the roll. Close the roll. Uh, Tabulate the vote. Madam, Madam President, pardon me. Uh, item 7, did you wish to in include that in, in the current vote? I know you called 8 uh, I special. Said eight. Uh, s did anybody put in a card on 7? No, ma'am. It is an ordinance, though. Okay, I can't, okay, I can't hear. Why don't we hold 7 on the desk, then, until we... Let's go ahead and vote. I, I don't think we'll reach 12 members today. There's too many people who have excuses. Yes. All right, so you want to open the roll on that? Those will be items 7 and 9. Okay, great. Thank you. Please open the roll. Yes. Tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. All right, next item. Items 10 through 23 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Madam President, motions are required on items 10, 11, 12, 15, and 16. Mr. Cardenas. Uh, 11 and 12 for Garcetti and 16 for Wiesar. All right, any Thank other you. specials members? All right, Mr. Clerk, can we open the roll? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to call 23 special, Mr. Clerk. I'm sorry, which? 23. 23, very good. Uh, Madam President, we, we do have cards uh, on Great. items, uh, okay. on those items listed above as well as item 19. All right, and for the remaining items, can we please open the roll? Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 10 ayes. Okay, thank you. That's okay. All right, next item. Items 24 through 28 are items scheduled for closed session. All right. Mr. Parks? Yes, I would uh, move that we hear all of the closed session items in open session with the exception of number 26. All right. If there is no objection to that, then we will uh, hold those items in open session. No. Madam, Madam President, if I may uh, read the recommendations then for items 24, 25, 27, and 28, uh, we could then take a vote. 
Item 24, there is a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled Saul Diaz versus City of Los Angeles for the amount of $125,000. Item number 25, there is a recommendation for settlement in the cases entitled Guadalupe Juarez versus Jorge Oseguera and Ruling Jen uh, versus Jorge Asegura for the amount of $165,000. In item 27, there is a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled Jimmy Grayson versus City of Los Angeles through a stipulated award in the amount of $264,574, which includes $215,247 in permanent disability indemnity and a life pension calculated out to $49,326. After taking, uh, taking credit for permanent disability advances in the amount of $15,000, the total new money payout will be $249,574. And in item 28, there's a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled Manuel Aguilar versus City of Los Angeles through two stipulated awards, the first being 29% disability in the amount of $28,692 at the weekly rate of $230, and the second being 78% disability in the amount of $151,537 at the weekly rate of $270. All right, now, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Did you want to open the roll on those now? All right, let's do that. And uh, Mr. Krikorian, you did press your button. Does that mean it's not on the board anymore? Does that mean you don't want to speak now? Uh, no. Or was that an uh, accident? No, Madam President. I just wanted to ask uh, for reconsideration of number 22 for purposes of amending. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do, open the roll on that in a minute. Let's take Thank care you. of this. Okay, let's take care of these items right now. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. And now let's go back to the item that Mr. Krikorian once reconsidered. We, need a mo we have a motion for reconsideration. Mr. Krikorian, can I have the item number again? Number 22, please. All right, motion for reconsideration on item tw 22. Uh, uh, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Ten ayes. Uh, this is a uh, amended 22A, which I believe has been circulated. Oh, it's not circulated. All right. All right, we're going to hold it on the desk, Mr. Krikorian, till your uh, colleagues have a chance to take a look it, at it. It hasn't it'll been circulated be distributed yet. in a moment. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. All right, next order of business. Madam President, uh, would you like to recess the regular meeting and go into the special meeting? Yes. Call the roll on the special meeting, please. Eller Concardness, Englander. Weezar, Koretz, Krikorian, LaBanche, Parks, Perry, Reyes, Rosendahl, West, and Zion, Garcetti, 10 members present, and a quorum, Madam President. Mm -hmm. All right. First order of business. Uh, Madam President, item 29 is an item for which a public hearing has not been held. 10 votes are required for consideration. All right. Oh. Open the roll on that. No, this is for uh, you can do consideration with with uh, without objection, Madam okay. President. We do have uh, one speaker card on that. Uh, Madam President, there is a request to continue the item uh, to August 17. Okay, is there any objection to that? If not, we will continue item 29 until August the 17th, without objection. Very good. Do you wish to adjourn the special and return to the regular? Yes. Madam President, that takes uh, Council back to items called special or public comment on items not on Council's agenda. All right, why don't we begin with public comment. Eugene Hernandez. Following Mr. Hernandez will be Arnold Sachs. Um, one thing that's certain regarding the a a uh, AEG deal and the NFL, is that the taxpayers are going to hold the bill and the politicians are going to reap the benefits. I can remember when the site that was, that's used currently by the LA Convention Center was a site of thousands of affordable housing and, and thousands of, of families had affordable housing. The city council removed that affordable housing stock and replaced it with a white elephant. Now you plan to do the same thing with the NFL stadium. And it's obvious that whoever gets to pay gets to play. Um, right now, AEG is going to be funding Tony Cardenas' campaign for Congress. 
Uh, Excuse AG me, sir. You should stop the clock for a second. When addressing uh, the city council, you address the body, not the individuals. Okay? Yes. And All right. So start the clock. And there's a certain mayoral candidate running this meeting who's going to benefit from Gensler, the design com consultant who's going to design the stadium. But w when I talk about sustainability, the taxpayers are going to be paying the bill for the traffic congestion, for the water, for the security, for policing the stadium. And AEG is not going to pass along the benefits to the taxpayers until their profit is made on the backs of the people going there. They're going to be charging $14 beer, bill, uh, beers, $50 to park. And what I fear is that we're going to be, again, holding the bag. It's funny that you fast-track these stadiums and projects like the Wilshire Grand after you get donations to run for political offices, but you don't fast-track the, the consumer watchdog agency, the ratepayer agency of the DWP. In my opinion, I am in favor of an NFL stadium, but I want it to be publicly owned, like the Green Bay Packers are publicly owned. As a matter of fact, the Dodgers should be publicly owned due to the, the corruption going on with the McCourts. You know, who is to say that the next NFL stadium is going to pack up and leave like Al Davis did to us before? You, you fast act the traffic, the, the, the approval, but you haven't allowed for the citizens to benefit from this deal. Thank you very much. Arnold Sachs. Following Arnold Sachs will be Yvonne Michelle. I can't. Autry. Yvonne Michelle Autry after Arnold Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. And by the way, when you mention a councilman's name, it doesn't necessarily mean you're addressing that councilman. You're just bringing up a point about that council person getting funding from AEG, right, Honorable Jan Perry. The gentleman was right. Here's an example he left out. You know, when AEG came before the council and said they need to build the stadium, they need to get $300 million in financing for the reconstruction of the new convention center, that was in December 2010. The latest offer that comes out in the papers over the weekend was, well, AEG is now going to build parking garages that weren't part of the original offer for $80 million, and the construction would, bonds would be $175 million. Well, 80 from 300 is 220, so where's the extra $45 million going? And more importantly, the bond sales went down, but the price of the project didn't go up. So when AEG came in front of the, state, the, the council to say they need $300 million for the convention center, they were lying because that $80 million was included for the parking garages that wasn't mentioned. Maybe you followed the Dodgers in the McCourt fiasco. The important thing to do, and Councilman Rosendahl, pay close attention, Frank McCourt, with the different subsidy, sub, subsidiary companies that he has running the Dodgers. So maybe you can't profit share with AEG, but what about profit sharing with the LA Arena Land Company, the subsidiary of AEG that runs Staples Center and probably will run the stadium? And Councilman Reyes isn't here, but he had some questions for the union rep who said we already signed an MOU with AEG. So is that MOU binding with LA Arena Land Company? Lots of questions, no answers. Thank you very much. And just for the record, Mr. Reyes is present at today's meeting. All right, Yvonne Michelle Autry. Yes, good morning. I thought you might have known me by now. Yes, my name is Yvonne Michelle Autry, and I'm commenting on, on the subject of rent stabilization. Uh, I'm commenting on, is that better for you? Good. I'm commenting on the, um, on the subject of rent stabilization. May 2011, we were present encouraging the council to honor the request of the working class, homeless, and uh, otherwise indigent economic uh, people who are suffering some economic distress, which is 
pretty much by and large all of us, at which time our item was not addressed. Again, human, one of the hum, basic human rights is the right to housing and maintenance, access to affordable housing as a result of that um, First Amendment right that we were exercising to assemble to address our representatives who were ignoring our requests in violation of our right to to housing, which is a civil and human right, members of uh, collective LA CAN were uh, assaulted and arrested, uh, which is um, it, usually one of the practices of uh, LAPD and other police departments is to then falsely accuse the victims as we were exercising our First Amendment rights to assemble and addressing our representatives who were ignoring us. Again, for the record, I'd like to assert that the police assaulted General Dogon. He did not assault seven to ten police officers. I was a witness here. And if you hadn't ignored our request to stabilize the rent, we wouldn't have had to demonstrate and react accordingly. You are favoring the wealthy. Um, you are favoring the real estate developers. I object to that. I would never vote for you, Ms. Perry, for mayor. I, I think you are a disgrace among black women. Yes, I do. And I think you are not the, honoring a the, democratic standard in this country. Stop the clock for a second, ma'am. Stop the clock for a second. Again, like to, to the, the same gentleman as before, I give you the same instruction. You are to address the body and not individuals, uh, individual members of the city council. Okay, you can start her clock again. You Thank you very much. You address me by name. You are my representative. Why can I address you by name? And it's an appropriation. I'm not profane. You're not going to violate our constitutional rights to address you. You're already ignoring... You see, every legal and lawful and peaceful attempt we make to address you. So you leave us no recourse. Thank you. All right, Mr. Clerk, what's our next item? That brings us to item eight called the uh, special for Council Member Perry. Okay. Mr. Zine, if you would trade seats with me. If you would let me speak from this position, uh, it's closer. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Mr. Cardenas. <laughs> this, is a, this is an ordinance to prohibit the purchase of animals on city sidewalks and streets. This is a citywide issue or a citywide problem and happens in some of our parks and other areas of the city. In many cases, these animals are way too young to be taken from their mothers and they are sick or ill. Small turtles that are frequently sold can carry salmonella and can be passed on to human beings. Um, this is a public safety, public health issue. Uh, the sale of animals on the public right of way is a detriment to the health of the animals and could be to the people who purchase them. Now, many of you know that animal services and LAPD frequently confiscate these animals, and yet this continues to be an ongoing problem. We go through a confiscation, it'll be quiet for a few min months, and then it starts all over again. People will continue to sell animals as long as they can make a profit. So by making it illegal to purchase animals, we hope to curtail this demand and stop this inhumane practice. This is the first reading of this ordinance. Very well. Are there, what item is this, uh, Ms. Perry? I think we have some cards. Number eight, we do have some cards. Yeah. Yes, uh, the first speaker will be Don Rosnowski. Good morning, Council. My name is Dawn Rosnowski, and I'm an educator with Glendale Unified School District. And I'm here just to urge your support for this. Um, the governor passed Senate Bill 917 last week, and that doesn't go into effect until January of 2012. And I'm encouraging uh, a quick, speedy implementation of this, if indeed it does pass. Um, and I'd like to thank every individual who is involved with supporting this as well. Uh, many people, I don't know their names, but I want to personally thank everyone who helped with this. And I'm just speaking on behalf of the voiceless animals, and I'm urging your support. Thank you very much. 
Question. Thank you. The individual from Bunny World. Ledger. Hazim. Mar yeah, that's a tough. One. That's an inch. Int can you pronounce the first and the last? Leila Hajmuratovic. Do the last one again. Hajmuratovic. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to meet you too. Um, thank you, Council. I'm here for the second time. Back in October, I um, requested, pleaded that we have this on the agenda, and I'm very happy to see that this is actually happening today. For three years, we've been trying to fight this particular issue, and it is refreshing to see it on the Senate floor. This has been actually um, – Senate floor and also actually – Senate, Senate passed it last um, Tuesday, so this is just the continuation of the existing law. Um, LAPD has been working really hard, city attorney's office, district attorney's office, our agency. Uh, Ms. Brenda Burnett has really taken this issue to heart and along with the LA Board of Commissioners has made it go into effect really quickly. Mayor's office has been on top of it. We're just waiting for the signs to be implemented in Santiali, Chinatown and other parts of LA. I would urge you all to consider um, this is a very important issue for it binds other issues like child labor. Um, it binds other issues like um, exotic sales of animals, which is a billion dollar industry. And if you could figure out a way how to implement it speedily and efficiently would be the most advantageous because the bill is as good as its implementation. Um, there is a problem that we still don't know how to resolve with people selling without an ID. And even if they get arrested and released, they are still going back to selling animals uh, the next day. So this purchase bill is going to really, really help. So thank you very much for taking care of this issue, and uh, hopefully you will pass it, and we will see free animals and less suffering in the future. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Gordon Lutz. Good morning, my name is Gordon Lutz. I volunteer with several different rescue organizations and I also volunteer with the Humane Society and the San Gabriel Shelter. Uh, every day I have to see and deal with the results of animals that have been dumped and these, a lot of these animals were bought illegally on the streets of LA, they're little babies, they come in, they're sick, they die. Uh, we try to care for them as best we can but we, we can't save them all. Um, Los Angeles has leash laws, zoning laws, rabies laws to protect a lot of animals. Uh, it, it really is time for Los Angeles to step up and protect the baby animals that are uh, being sold illegally on the streets. Um, animal cruelty and the inhumane sale of animals is not the face of Los Angeles. It's not what Los Angeles wants to be about. So I really urge you to pass this bill and let's implement it and let's stop the little baby animals uh, from dying on our streets. Thank you. Commander Andrew Smith, Los Angeles Police Department, Public Information Officer, PIO. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Andrew Smith, nice to see you all again. Um, I'm the new public information officer for the department, but prior to that I was uh, working over in West Bureau, which covers Venice Beach, and I was also in Central Bureau and uh, worked in downtown for quite a while. I could uh, spend uh, my two minutes entirely uh, ten times over telling you stories over and over about the cruelty that we've seen to the animals on the streets, the children that get heartbroken when they go home with an animal that's sick or injured and ends up dying on them within the next day or two. I won't get into that. I just want to tell you that this is... Uh, this ordinance is part of a collaboration of a bunch of private citizens, a bunch of animal activist groups, rescue organizations, members of the police department, certainly strong support from many members of the city council, and we've all worked together with animal services to try and solve this problem in Santee Alley and in our parks and in Venice Beach where people are selling these animals uh, without any kind of regulation, without any kind of inoculation, without any kind of... Um, uh, guarantees that these animals are even here in this country illegally. So um, I'm here to just uh, say I support this and thank uh, Councilman Perry for her strong support on this and taking a leadership role. It's a small piece in a puzzle. This is a big problem, but this is just one small piece in the puzzle of enforcement and education. And hopefully uh, by passing this and moving on with some of the other components that we have, we'll end this practice and make downtown and Santee Alley and Venice Beach a much safer and a much more pleasant place to be. Thank you all. Thank you, Commander. Anyone on the queue? 
No one on the queue. Well, in that case, let's open the roll. Well, in that case, we'll get a card and we'll bring it up. Jason. Hold on, hold on. The uh, Sergeant Arms will get your card. I'm with Bunny Wolf Foundation. And What's your uh, name? Valida Carroll. Go ahead. And I have seen firsthand um, the deaths that this, um, the sale of illegal animals has been causing because I have often come to my sister's house when a batch of 20 or 30 babies comes in and they're only two, three weeks old and she tries to revive them and most of the times these little babies die the most gruesome and painful deaths because they need their mother's milk and none of these sellers seem to care. So I really urge you to pass this ordinance because it's really for the benefit of the society and for the animal rights. Thank you so much. Thank you. Get your card to the uh, Sergeant Arms, ma'am. He's got to get that card. It's got to go in the file. Okay, thank you. So this matter is now before us for a vote, colleagues. Please open the roll, close the roll, and tabulate the vote. Eleven ayes. Very well. Thank you. That matter passes. Next item, please. Uh, for, for the record, that will be held over for uh, one week for uh, second reading. Excuse me, Mr. City Attorney. Say that again. As I'm sure the clerk meant to say, is that the matter will be held over for a second reading next week. Right. There's not enough to have it passed on the first. It's passed, but technically we have to vote again next week, so that's what will happen. And number 23, please. Number 23. Item 23 called special for Council Member Perry and cards. Miss Perry and cards. You want the cards? Or you want to speak first? Um, I, I just want to say a few words and then let's take the cards. Uh, I think we're all pretty aware of the horrible accident that took place during Art Walk that resulted in the loss of a very young child. And uh, it's just, just devastating. Out of that, we have created an Art Walk task force uh, that includes my council district and Mr. Huizar's council district, county health representatives from the business improvement districts, Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council and appropriate city departments. The goal of the task force will be to create a safer, more sustainable art walk. We have met informally three times already as a task force and we'll have another meeting this week. Uh, we look forward to input uh, from everyone who has a stake in the success of this endeavor. And um, that's all I need to say right now, Mr. Chair, and all right. let's just take the cards. Thank you. Uh, Brady Westwater, followed by Arnold Sachs, Patty Berman, and then Russ Brown, the four speakers on this matter. Brady, take Hi. it away. My name is Brady Westwater. I'm one of the original people involved with both Gallery Row and the Art Walk. I'm here speaking solely on my own behalf. I've watched Art Walk grow. I've seen what it's done for downtown, not just historic downtown, but all of downtown. But it's gotten so large now, it needs to finally have some measures determining how it's going to be logistically run. And it's something only the city's authority is going to be able to provide. So we thank very much Councilman Jan Perry and Councilman Jose Wiesar for taking the action on this. Thank you. Arnold Sachs. Then Patty Berman and Russ Brown, if you can be prepared to uh, take the microphone as your name comes up. Yes, thank you. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Um, I have no problems with this task force, but I think it should be expanded, not to just include art walks, but any kind of function. You just had Navy Week in San Pedro with 40,000 people. And it took two days to alleviate traffic congestion. All these, all these departments that are involved in this Art Walk Task Force, Public Works, Transportation, Police Planning, Fire, Building and Safety, and various city council representatives, there should be a standing task force that should implement some programs and some policies that would address a situation where a large crowd may or may not attend a function. Several years ago, there was a Pavarotti concert at LA Stadium, a Dodger Stadium, created huge traffic jams. You just had the so-called concerns about the 405 closure. There are different events that occur throughout the city 
that would require a standing task force to set down some guidelines that could be implemented throughout the city that would affect all the city, all the council districts as a whole, because they would have some kind of plan that would be involved to allow for the passage of huge volumes of traffic, huge volumes of pedestrians, and you would just have to implement it to meet the concerns of that particular event. But it's a, maybe a good idea, maybe the leadership needs to be changed, but it's a good idea to be expressed throughout the whole city and not limited to just an art walk. Patty Berman, followed by Russ Brown. Thank you. My name is Patty Berman. I'm the president of the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council. First, I would very much like to thank Council Members Perry and Huizar for bringing this to you. Uh, even before we heard about this motion coming before the City Council, d has been preparing a statement asking for pretty much exactly what you people are doing now. The Art Walk now has 30,000 people going up to 40 or 50 this month because the weather will be good. We need the help of the City as a partner to help us to manage properly and to be able to take care of people who are doing illegal actions during the Art Walk. Uh, I can't tell you how much the Neighborhood Council appreciates that this is being brought before you. Please, we need your help in keeping our neighborhood safe, not only for our visitors, but for the people who live there. So thank you very much. Russ Brown, next and final speaker on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Russell Brown. I'm executive director of the historic downtown business improvement district. I was also president of the neighborhood council for five years and an eight-year resident in the Old Bank district. We wholeheartedly and enthusiastically support this joint motion by both CD9, Jan Perry, and uh, CD14, Jose Huizar. The monthly art walk is grassroots organizing at its best. Uh, seven years ago, five art galleries that position themselves in abandoned retail spaces in the middle of adjacent to Skid Row at 5th and Main, created an event that was a downtown open house. Since then, seven years later, we have over 100 businesses, galleries, restaurants, bars, and many other pop-up facilities attracting more than 30,000 people downtown. We've truly taken downtown back to be the center of a great living community. But as part of that, we need to regulate this. At its core, Art Walk is a downtown open house. Um, that many people can sort of do whatever they want to do. A lot of this is on private property. Unfortunately, we're at saturation point on a lot of our sidewalks, so this motion allows us to help coordinate with all the city departments, rules and regulations within a defined footprint to help manage this, to not only keep it sustainable, but safe for everybody in the community and focused on downtown local businesses and arts and culture. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to working together to keep the art walk going, but make it as safe as possible. Thank you. Mr. Weezer. Thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank everyone who came out to speak on this item today. Um, a lot of you are active and involved in the downtown community, and that's what makes uh, downtown a wonderful community and one that uh, uh, not only brought forward one of the largest open space, uh, out, I mean outdoor events that the city has witnessed in a long time. We're a community where the Angelinos from all sectors come together to walk the streets of downtown LA, enjoy its history, enjoy its art, and pretty much enjoy each other. Uh, it's, it's a one-of-a-kind event that has had a lot of success. Unfortunately, the incident that happened where a newborn uh, was killed uh, it, it is a very tragic event that we certainly don't want that to occur again. And uh, even without any of the incidents that have happened, uh, this uh, event was ripe for some more uh, regulation. Uh, that evening, in fact, I had spoken to a couple of my friends uh, at another event, uh, and they told me they had left the art walks because it just had gone too crowded. They couldn't find space on the sidewalks. They had to walk on the street to get around uh, some uh, certain corners, and uh, it, it appeared to me even that night that something had to be done to help coordinate the event better. It's one thing when we have an organic uh, kind of grassroots event to sprout up on its own, and, and we want to let it go, and, and, and you know, hopefully it continues to succeed. But at some point, uh, we do have to step in to help regulate it, to make it safe for everyone so that it could continue and we wouldn't have to shut it down because of its own success. So thank you for your support. 
we've had several conversations already, and this is uh, more, uh, the motion's more just to formalize the task force that uh, we've created to already uh, keep this dialogue going. So thank you for coming here today, and I, I look forward to uh, coming up with some sensible regulations that will allow this wonderful event to keep going. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Weezer. Uh, that's the only speaker on the queue. Colleagues, open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. Very well. That passes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kokorian, number 22. Are there any cards on that, sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't know if there are. I believe that there probably are not. We reconsidered this matter for purposes of no. an amending motion, which is before the members today. Uh, this is a reward motion in a tragic murder that occurred five years ago in a domestic violence situation uh, in which a, a bright young woman named Victoria Ramirez was uh, taken from us. Uh, the suspect has been known for five years. Uh, and has been has evaded capture. Uh, so this is a reward motion. The amendment is simply to increase the amount of the reward from 25,000 to 50,000 in the hopes of uh, encouraging someone who knows the whereabouts of this man to, to help bring, help us bring him to justice. All right. Thank you, Mr. Corian. On that matter, I'll open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. Eleven eyes. Very well. Next item, please. Mr. President, that brings us to item number ten. Number ten. We do have cards on number 10. Trent Lang. And I will turn this back to Ms. Perry. Hi, Trent Lang, uh, President of the California Clean Money Campaign. Uh, uh, we're very excited to have this ordinance uh, in, in front of you uh, uh, to implement the will of the voters in uh, Measure H, which won with 75 percent of the vote, thanks, thanks to your guys uh, putting it on, on the ballot, um, uh, to ban uh, uh, city contractors over a certain level from, from contributing to ca uh, candidates and also doing fundraising. One of the key points, there are two different options here. Uh, the option A uh, would uh, would limit the fundraising ban to only basically city employees. It's a relatively limited fundraising ban. We believe that the will of the voters and the will of the council was for the option B, that prohibiting fundraising in general from city contractors in those narrow circumstances. We would agree with the Ethics Commission that that's defensible. It's what the voters were asking for, and so we'd urge you to uh, uh, support um, option B to prohibit uh, contractors from doing fundraising generally. Uh, in the worst case, the, the council uh, uh, it should it should hold up in court. In the worst case, then we might have to narrow it again. But it was the will of voters to prohibit fundraising generally speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are no other cards on this item, and no speakers in the queue. So, Mr. Clerk, if you would please open the roll on this item. Uh, pardon me, Madam President. Mm -hmm. This matter was submitted from the Rules and Elections Committee without recommendation. A motion is required. Okay. A motion is required. Would you I, – I need this one member. Okay. The chair of the Rules and Elections Committee is not here today. Who's the vice chair? Mr. Huizar. Uh, Madam Chair, can I ask that we continue this item, please, for a week? Um, yeah. That's it, fine. Does it, does it, um, there's no timelines, I, I believe, okay. so thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Huizar. We will continue this matter for one week from today. That would be August without, 10th. Without objection. All right. Thank you. What's our next item? N Madam President, that brings us to item number 11. A again, it's a matter uh, that was uh, forwarded from the Rules and Elections Committee without recommendation. A motion is required. Um... Mr. Huizar, would you like to make a motion to continue 11 also until next week? It's yes, it, similar. Well, would that, any timelines on that as well? Do you know the answer to that? Uh, this, the city attorney. Hold on a second, your mic's not on yet. Good morning, council members. Deputy City Attorney Renee Stottle. Item number 11 and actually number 12 are related, and they really need to be um, 
uh, discussed and voted on today because we are in a tight, tight time crunch because it relates to the CD15 vacancy election. Okay, well, we, have a, we don't have any recommendation from the committee. Uh, does anybody, is there anyone here, the CLA here, uh, uh, for that committee who can tell us uh, what the purpose of having no recommendation is or what, what the point is here? Charles Modick of the CLA's office. Uh, this item was heard in committee last week. Uh, it's related to amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code to be in compliance with the Supreme Court decision in the uh, Arizona fundraising case. Uh, when this was heard in council two weeks ago, there are a variety of motions introduced that had to do with placing uh, special conditions on enhancing the city's matching funds system for the uh, special election to fill the vacancy in Council District 15. Um, because of the council's upcoming recess, uh, because of the uh, council's upcoming recess, it's necessary to get some kind of action from council on uh, bringing the city's matching funds system, first of all, into compliance with um, congr or constitutional law per the Supreme Court decision, uh, and then to make any changes for the special election in CD15 before you enter recess. Do you have any, uh, can you give me the reason why there is no recommendation coming out of committee? Uh, there was a lack of quorum in the committee, and so it was just sent forth as a communication from the chair. And oh. there are three options before the council. Great. All right, hold on a second. Let me go. Mr. Mr. Englander pressed his button, and then Mr. Rosendahl. Okay. Um, yeah, and looking at this, it doesn't look like there is any financial impact information into the city's general fund in terms of changing all of these allocations um, with a three to one match, uh, with the $125,000 to $150,000 ceiling. Um, and so I would recommend that unless we have that information, we don't use elections at this point right now uh, to test the waters, if you will, um, to try out and change different ceilings and contributions. We've got some holistic ordinances we're asking for information back. I think ethics has already weighed in on some of those as well. Um, we're asking for uh, that research to be conducted and sent back to committee before we make those kinds of drastic changes and experiment with a live election. Uh, I don't think it's in the best interest financially of the city to do that at this point. Uh, so I would recommend a no vote on those for those reasons. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl. Uh, I appreciate what Mr. England is saying. I'd like to separate 11 and 12. Uh, obviously, I think the 15th district and its election is a key issue, and we need to get that going, and I don't want to run them together, because you also know that my position on 11 is the federal government, uh, the Supreme Court did the wrong thing, and I ain't going to back them in something that was as ridiculous as what they did to campaign finance reform. Mr. Alarcon. Yes, council members, uh, uh, the, the rules as they are, if we do nothing, uh, would essentially, uh, uh, we're, we're essentially built on, on, on considerations uh, prior to the court's decision. Uh, so the need to act uh, is, is pertinent to the upcoming election because the court's decision will change the rules. And I believe they have to be modified to bring us back into, into uh, uh, trying to protect the notion that, that super wealthy people can't come in and drop a bunch of money on a campaign uh, and win. And I think that's pertinent in the 15th Council District as it is citywide. Uh, we would like to have the benefit of uh, an analysis, uh, Mr. Englander, but the reality is we don't have time. Uh, so this is a judgment call, clearly. Uh, this is not intended to be a perfect solution. It is, uh, it is intended specifically to diminish the, uh, the, uh, the compelling uh, or, or at least um, uh, complementary uh, rules that exist right now that would encourage wealthy candidates to drop a lot of money in the race. Now, as a fact, I, I can tell you there's at least one wealthy candidate ready to do that in the, in the 15th Council District. And I think uh, to, to balance against those odds uh, that, that we have to provide uh, additional uh, a, a discouragement from, from that happening. Uh, we can't do it in the way that we did it before because the courts have said no, and, and uh, whether you agree with that or not, the courts acted. Uh, so I offered... Uh, uh, number um, item 11 
as an option that, that I think would temporarily balance those odds while we can conduct further analysis on the budget and all other implications. I don't believe one, in fact, in fact, if we could ask uh, uh, the appropriate person how much money is in the fund and how much is likely to be depleted by one council race. Good morning, Heather Holt for the Ethics Commission. Uh, the trust fund, the matching funds trust fund is at uh, a balance of a little bit over $12 million at this point. Um, the first option presented here would have no effect on the trust fund and in fact would probably save us some money because some of the triggers uh, would, would be suspended. Um, the second option uh, could be absorbed through for the special elections. Um, we have some concern though because the if this if the second option were applied uh, citywide on a permanent basis, it could not sustain it. Okay. Okay. I only have nine seconds left, so let me just say, and I'll press my button if I have to. I don't want to, but um, this is this my my uh, motion is is just temporary for this election, and we can do a better analysis as we go on. I think it goes much further to protect against uh, the concerns that that I mentioned, and I would encourage that we vote for item 11. I have I have haven't really taken a close look at item 12. I'd like to hear more about it. Mr. Englander. Uh, colleagues, you know, I, I would move today then that we implement the findings of the Supreme Court based on what we heard uh, immediately without, though, any changes on financial impacts at this time. Looking at the different options, there's an immediate impact on, on the city's general fund of up to $600,000 on one option and $1.2 million on another. We haven't identified where those funds would necessarily come from. Again, I think we need to look at that holistically and what we plan on doing in all future elections. So I would, I would immediately move that we imp implement uh, those findings from the Supreme Court without changing any of the financial structures of the election at this time. Mr. Alarcon. <sighs> yeah, the problem is we have 10, 10 members here. We, how many votes do we need? Eight? Okay, then uh, I would like to move. I would like to move item uh, 11B, uh, which is uh, to increase the limits uh, temporarily for uh, for the 15th council district race, increasing the caps on uh, matching funds and uh, and uh, how much money you can raise. For clarification, that's 111B. 111B. No second. Mr. Parks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm totally confused. Uh, one of the things, could you just walk us slowly through 11, if that's the item we're talking about, what are the changes that are recommended versus what we're doing now? In item number 11, there are there are two ordinances under item number 11 and then a request for another ordinance. The first ordinance was the ordinance uh, our office originally transmitted to temporarily suspend the uh, matching fund trigger provisions in order to comply with the Supreme Court decision. That's all that ordinance does. That's on 11. That's 11 1 A. 1 A. 11 1 B is um, the motion that Councilmember Alarcon made. The ordinance is before you. It, it suspends the matching funds trigger provisions again but as well as increases the amount of available matching funds in both the primary and the general, fund, general election, as well as raises the spending limits in both of those elections. The ordinance requested in item 11 and in, in item, and presented in item 12 is the third option which increases the formula for matching funds from a, to a $3 uh, three dollar matching for one dollar of contributions as well as suspending the trigger provisions and raising the amount of funds available to participating candidates in general election to hundred and fifty thousand dollars as opposed to hundred and twenty five okay let me just ask the uh, ethics I think it's item 16 is that 
part of what we're asking for a more thorough review before we make substantive changes. Uh, my understanding is that items 15 and 16 are uh, requests for reviews of the, of the matching funds program and other campaign finance provisions uh, in terms of permanent uh, changes. changes. 11 and 12 would be temporary, temporary changes for just election. for the CD15 okay. elections. All right. yes. And then let me go back to City Attorney. On dealing with 1A, is the narrow, dis the narrow interpretation of exactly what the Supreme Court dictated? Nothing more. That's it. Yeah, okay. that's correct, Council Member. Thank you. Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah, I, I'm a little confused. I agree with Mr. Alicorn about upping the monies um, for that CD15, but I really don't want to tie it to the Supreme Court's action. Is there a way to, to, to bifurcate it and, and pull that out? I mean, I like 111B that Mr. Alicorn did. Uh, he agrees so we can bifurcate. Because I, I don't want to support the Supreme Court. They're responsible in their behavior, period. And I'm not going to buy into their stuff. Okay. It, it, would, it would require us to bring back another ordinance that only had those provisions in it without the trigger um, provision. Mr. Englander? Yeah, I was simply going to make the same request, that we bifurcate the two and we go ahead and move on 1A today to implement those changes based on the Supreme Court decision so they don't impact these elections as well. I think you meant 11A? Did you 11, mean 11? 11? 11-1A. 11-1A, 11, 11, all right. Um, Mr. Wesson? Request to uh, my colleague, our colleague Richard, to walk through again what he wants to do. Mr. Alarcon. I'm Mr. Weston. Yeah, I'm sure, let me find the motion real quick. Oh, here it is. Uh, what, what my motion would do was increase the matching funds for city council candidates in the 15th uh, council district race by 100,000 in the primary election and 100,000 in the general election. Um, it also increases the spending limit uh, to 500,000 in the primary election and 450,000 in the general election. Uh, there, in the original, uh, under the rules uh, that we have in place today without the Supreme Court consideration, uh, we, we were trying to balance against wealthy candidates from coming in and dumping a lot of money into a race. Uh, if, if we take away those protections, then the only way that we can balance, or at least a quick way to balance uh, the equation, would be to increase the spending cap for others and increasing the matching funds in general as opposed to triggering it by uh, a wealthy candidate contributing and then it's triggered because that is what the Supreme Court shot down. Uh, so this, this provides that all candidates would be eligible for additional matching funds uh, and uh, the limits would be raised on spending uh, for one election, for the one election cycle, for this one election in the 15th Council District. Excuse me. Thank you. and, and to, uh, and uh, Mr. Rosendahl asked that we bifurcate the question of the trigger. My, uh, my, I'm, I'm fine with the I'm not, well, I, I recognize the Supreme Court decision in my motion, uh, but, but I agree that uh, if Mr. Rosendahl would want to separate the questions, that that would be okay too. Okay, now I understand there was no recommendation from the committee, but what was the recommendation from the other uh, departments? What, what did you recommend to the committee even though it didn't have a quorum? We made a recommendation that uh, probably option three would be the better fiscal alternative. It more closely mirrors the law that we have in place and does a good job of maintaining the effectiveness of the program in light of the Supreme Court decision. However, we did specify that both option B and option C, which is actually in item number 12, could be sustained by the trust fund for just this one special election. Uh, from a fiscal perspective, uh, however, the, the third option, option C, is probably the uh, safer path. Now, are we certain that we can legally do this for one election and not open ourselves up 
later on if we decide to go another way. It's the only thing that gets me, like, and I, I think I hear it with a lot of my colleagues, is we want a more comprehensive, uh, detailed report because many of us truly believe that now is the appropriate time to look at revamping the system. So I, for one, wouldn't want to do something that sets a precedent and handcuffs us by the time you return with your detailed report to us. So uh, I guess my question would be to maybe Mr. Englander, um, a one-time, could you do a one-time? No, and I'm just, I'm, this is something worth debating, so I'd like. Okay. I'd like to have the full financial impact. I support um, uh, a lot of the ideas and concepts behind it, particularly in light of uh, the cost in CPI and the cost of running campaigns and, and, and the idea that candidates have to spend so much time fundraising and a wealthy candidate could come in and self-fund and not have to do all that, that it takes them out of the field of talking to voters and neighborhood council members and stakeholders. So I support looking at a lot of those concepts, but there's a tremendous financial impact on that. We haven't studied that yet. Um, and to run through this again as an experiment, um, because we have an election coming up, that experiment is a cost of $1.2 million potentially without truly looking at the impacts or what those thresholds should be. And those have to be vetted and discussed. We have uh, enough elections coming up in the very near future and six council elections in the next two years. We have enough experimental time, if you will. And I think there's enough candidates, high visible candidates that are running in the 15th that I've seen so far that are well qualified to know how to raise money. That won't be an issue. Um, you know, I recently ran as hey, I, Mr. As Engler, I, are you on Mr. Weston's time because there's other people in the queue? Because my, my time is gone. With, without, without any matching funds at all um, and didn't take any taxpayer funds. So I, 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 look, I think we should look at all those options, but we need to study them. All right, Ms. Senate Perry. Committee. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm very concerned about consistency. I understand the need to um, be in compliance with the Supreme Court decision, and I believe that's 11A. Uh, and and Mr. Alarcon, I, Mr. Alarcon, I understand. Thank you for explaining that, but I, I'm, I would like more financial analysis on 11B. And um, I'm, I'm just not, I am not willing to vote affirmatively on 11B and 12 until I get that analysis. Uh, so I, I need to understand the ramifications uh, Thank before you. I take a vote on that. So. Can the uh, table answer that? That's it. No. Okay. Um, Can you answer Ms. Perry's question? I believe that the Ethics Commission submitted a report yesterday, or, or dated August 2nd, that uh, details the economic impacts to the special fund that supports the matching funds program. Um, if they'd like to go over it, they can, but this would be only for uh, the special election CD15 for the impact. Uh, any longer term changes, we would have to do a more in-depth analysis to see what changes going down the line. That's correct. And uh, in addition to the fiscal issues, there are the policy issues too. The uh, matching funds program and all of the campaign finance laws are, are complex and changing one aspect of the laws can have a, an unintended or unthought of consequence or effect on another provision. Uh, so in addition to needing to uh, be good stewards of the public money that's in the matching funds trust fund, we also want to maintain a robust and attractive and effective program so that we can continue to encourage uh, candidates to participate in uh, city elections. So that was part of what we uh, addressed as well in the letter, which is when we're talking about a long-term change for on a permanent basis, all of these factors need to be considered. From a strictly financial perspective, we can accommodate all three of the options uh, for just the special elections. Um, when we start looking at those proposals as becoming permanent law that affects candidates citywide, that's when we have concerns about the effect on the matching funds trust fund and in fact 
uh, option B would be unsustainable. Uh, we would not be able to fully fund all participating candidates in the 2013 regular elections if option B were adopted as permanent law. And as Mr. Wesson alluded to, precedent is a, an important consideration, and that was another factor uh, for why we lean toward option C, because once we have set this in motion, I don't think that the city attorney can correct me, I don't think there's a legal prohibition to uh, adopting one set of laws for a special election and then adopting something that's different on a permanent basis. However, there is the experiential precedent uh, for folks who are out there and, uh, and understandings of what can be expected from the matching funds program in an election. So there is a precedent issue to consider as well. Thank you. Mr. Cardenas. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, if Jerry Miller, I'd like to ask you some questions. And also, uh, City Attorney, you might uh, be chiming in uh, perhaps on, on the answer to my question as well. Can you please help clarify for the body here? If we were to withhold on an item, such as either item 11 or 12 or both, how does that play out as far as the timing as we've been reminded by the staff? And also, how does it work when it comes procedurally? Uh, and what, what is the process for us to actually act affirmatively and completely on these two items? Uh, certainly. Um, well, procedurally, any, any council member can withhold on an ordinance. Correct. And And what that does, in essence, is um, uh, in essence, it, it ends the debate and then brings the ordinance back for a second reading a week later. Okay, and a second reading is required on these two items in any case? Yes. Okay, so we're going to see these two items come back regardless. So being that uh, it appears that um, myself included and some of my colleagues would like to take the opportunity to actually determine how we'd like to vote at the end of the day, which the end of the day wouldn't be today, it would be on a second reading, correct? So a withhold would still afford us the opportunity to have the time that some of us may want, yet at the same time not delay it in a way, because the break is coming up, delay it in a way where if we don't withhold today, that we could in inadvertently cause ourselves a problem of timing and being able to uh, vote on this matter completely by the time the break comes. Uh, uh, correct. A withhold today would mean it would come back next Wednesday for a second reading, and timing is an issue. It, um, an ordinance would need to be passed, signed, and published prior to the 22nd, which is the first filing date for the, for the um, open seat. Okay. Just a question of the city attorney. Do you concur with that interpretation? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to move that uh, we withhold items 11 and 12 at this time. Or withhold. Is there a I second? Without objection. And there's no second, Mr. Ellicott? No unless, unless there's objection. Second. Second, Mr. Wiesar. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl. Yeah. Um, what is the deadline for CD15 to, to get our act together for that? The candidate filing week begins August 22nd. We need to have an effective ordinance in place on August 22nd, which means that the ordinance needs to be passed on first or second read. The mayor has to have time to consider signing it, and it needs to be published. Um, uh, it would take a couple days for us to get it to pub published. It doesn't have the, the okay, regular 30 if we, days. If we didn't do that, what would happen to CD15's election? Well, there would be legal, we would have legal, we would have risk of legal challenges from candidates um, who are participating or deciding not to participate um, based on the status of the program at the time that they signed up for it. I see. And I still have about a minute left. Trent, would you get up to the mic and make your comment on my last minute? What you think makes sense? Hi, uh, uh, Trent Lang, Clean Money Campaign. Uh, we believe it makes sense to do option C because it's effectively the current law uh, when in cases when there are high spenders. This is going to be a race where there's going to be high spenders and independent expenditures. Option C provides exactly the same funding as in current law uh, uh, would be if there were high spenders, but without having those triggers that would concern the Supreme Court. So that's why we'd say option C, same as current law, provides enough funding, but uh, uh, hopefully the city attorney would agree would also protect us from the Supreme Court decision. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Reyes. I, 
I don't mean to sound sarcastic or flippant, but I'm trying to understand why. I mean, why are we doing this? It's, it's, I'm trying to understand the, the different, the pros and cons. Can anyone just share that with us? Well, council members, the, the reason why it was originally brought before you was because of the very recent Supreme Court decision and because we have this vacancy election on our, on our doorstep right now. So the original reason why this was brought before you was simply to suspend the matching funds trigger provisions which have now been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. I think at that time um, some, uh, some, some of your colleagues thought it was perhaps a time to try some other things out at the same time. So it's kind of like an experiment. Yes. <laughs> that has a dollar figure attached to it. Yes, and I would add that I think it's more than simply an experiment because if we were to simply eliminate the trigger provisions, that, would, that could have a very serious effect on the attractiveness and the effectiveness of the matching funds program. In the Supreme Court decision, the, the um, uh, majority stated that it, it was the triggers that were a concern for them and that additional upfront uh, grants, essentially, to uh, publicly funded candidates were acceptable. And so this is an attempt to say, okay, we're going to take the trigger uh, provisions out of it, but we're going to fund at the same levels as if the triggers had already been pulled. So we are going to give more money to candidates up front and in option C also um, uh, provide funds at a faster rate so that for every matchable contribution you would get three dollars instead of one. Um, so there, there are policy considerations involved as well. So the logic from certain perspectives is to create a greater sense of plurality and competition, those who don't have deep pockets. That's correct. Have the capacity to participate, and this doesn't become a game for, or a challenge for those who have the wherewithal That's to even correct. consider being a candidate. And by increasing it, we're creating a greater playing field, if you will, for a whole range of candidates who otherwise would not afford it. Exactly, and, and a greater sense of confidence among participating candidates that they would be able to compete against those who have um, large sums of personal money or have independent expenditures spent um, in their support. Okay, thank you. Mr. Alarcon? Yeah, I think the uh, explanation, uh, the, the, the primary purpose is to balance the odds against any potential that a wealthy candidate could come in and try to buy the election. That's the bottom line. The Supreme Court decision took away the balancing that we had provided prior to that. Um, in doing so, we would have to take some action to try to balance the odds. Now, frankly, there are rumors that, that I've heard, that you might have heard, that there may be a candidate that has substantial wealth who could jump into this 15th Council District race. And I don't mind if they do. But if they do, I think we need to do something to balance the odds for those candidates who don't have uh, that kind of wealth. And so uh, I offered uh, what I think is a reasonable temporary uh, solution given that we can't have the complete analysis, notwithstanding the fact we do have a statement from the Ethics Commission that there's ample funds uh, not only to cover this, but, but it would have a, a relatively de minimis effect on the fund. So I think this is appropriate. I agree with Councilmember Cardenas that uh, on his withhold, uh, because I would like to, frankly, have a, a, a closer look at the three-to-one provision. I'm not exactly sure why we need to do that. Uh, I, I think that may go uh, too far. So I want to take another look at that, and, and I haven't had a chance to do that because I just saw it today. Uh, so I support uh, his action to withhold. And, and besides, we only have ten members here. Hopefully we'll have more than 10 that uh, can make a more considered decision. Mr. Englander? I just wanted to close with one thing, and that was that, um, you know, we've, we've been looking at the fiscal problems in the city and realizing that we've been not hiring more police officers, closing fire stations, not paving streets. There's been a big debate about whether we should continue pave, taking care of sidewalks and fixing sidewalks, whether it's the responsibility of the city or not to fix sidewalks, yet we're still paying out all the lawsuits for sidewalks. We didn't anticipate having a special election, although we knew it was probably coming, but it wasn't budgeted. That was a million and a half dollars. 
Um, at some point, uh, we, we, we can't just keep throwing money at the problem because we realize there's going to be wealthier candidates or independent expenditures. Um, I had neither one in, in, in my race. But we also know there's, there's probably one or two or three billionaires looking at running for mayor. Perhaps we should look at completely funded campaigns in the mayoral race um, to level the playing field and just spend millions of dollars of unlimited general fund money at doing that. At some point, we've got to say we've got a system that probably works. We've, we, we've just delayed um, putting off until next week, looking at tightening the provisions that the voters just passed to make it more difficult to raise money because the voters and, and, uh, and, and all of you, and, and I support that as well, is tougher, transparent, um, clean elections to show where you're getting money from to make sure that there's no influence coming from special interest, that we, have, we don't have bidders and subcontractors raising millions of dollars for candidates and trying to influence not only elections but then their bids as well. And so I support all of those initiatives. But at the same time, then just throwing money at the problem to say there's going to be these other influences we're creating um, the perfect storm uh, to spend unlimited general fund dollars and trying to level a, an artificial playing field. And then, and then since we don't have all that worked out yet, there's a proposal to say, well, let's experiment, which makes no sense and has horrific financial consequences that haven't been weighed on at all. And for every dollar we spend, we've got to keep in mind it's a dollar we don't put towards public safety. It's a dollar we don't put towards our communities, towards libraries. Uh, towards helping those who need help the most. We've got a big debate coming up next week about animal shelters and who's going to be taking care of those, trying to maintain our city workforce, um, trying to end furloughs and put people back to work. We've got to take all of this in context uh, because that's what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Englander and Ms. Perry. Um, to the city attorney, we've had a member withhold already and a second member who said that they supported that withhold uh, procedurally once a member indicates that they want to withhold should the discussion continue or is that tantamount to taking a vote I, I, I'm sorry can you repeat uh, that? one member has already said that they wanted to withhold a second member has said that they're willing to support that withhold so procedurally is that the equivalent of taking a vote and should should the discussion now cease uh, since one member's indicated they wanted to withhold and a second member said they support that withhold or do we need to vote on the withhold there, there is no vote on withhold one member just needs to uh, state uh, that he is that, or she is that withholding, but it, but it does not. I don't believe it ends debate though, uh, without without moving the previous. So questions. it's not. The, do we need to vote on the withhold? Uh, no, yeah, I understand. So somebody it. can say they they withheld, and then we can just keep talking. I understand so that on withhold there could be an objection, and on objection then it would be a vote on the withhold. No, the, so I, wait, I can I call the question on the withhold? May I call the question on the motion to withhold? Well, there's actually no motion to withhold. There's Being just created. a council member can state, I withhold, and, and the matter's withheld. So the, so the matter automatically goes over to next week. But Mr. City Attorney. There still are some matters to be determined. There is an amendment out there that has not been uh, voted on. And just because one member withholds, that does not in and of itself end debate. But the question I have is on the withhold. If someone objects to the withhold, then there's a vote? No. There is there's not no a vote. vote. It's withheld. So withheld unanimous consent. Clarification. The matter is now formally withheld, which means it will go over to next week because of what two members, one member initiated, one member supported. So we don't have to do anything else on that. So we can end debate, Mr. City Attorney? No. I, I, my understanding is that's not what he said. What he said is the matter is withheld but the discussion can continue. Is that what I, did I understand you? That's correct. For clarification, unanimous consent is withheld. Okay. And the, the question I have, Mr. Clerk, how many folks are here next Wednesday? Because we have 10 currently. How many are here next Wednesday? You can have discussion again. Okay. We are going to have this discussion again next week. Current, currently, we're, we're scheduled to have uh, 12 members in attendance. All right. Well, Mr. Reyes, you're up. Call the question. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. So now the question's been called. Anyone opposed? 
Mr. Ray has just called the question. Yes, he did, to call the question. So we'll take a vote on that since there's some discussion on the ending debate calling the question. Open the roll. Mr. President, there's, there's uh, no one on the queue. However, a vote would be required for uh, the amendment uh, offered by uh, Mr. Rosendahl to bifurcate um, uh, Mr. Uh, Alarcon's uh, recommendation to exclude the trigger provision. So then that request. Mr. City Attorney has a comment on that. Right, and, and that motion to amend the ordinance would be treated as an instruction to draft a new ordinance, which would be before council next week as a first reading ordinance, as opposed to these other three versions, which would be second reading ordinances. All right, so Mr. Clerk, what do we do next? Mr. Rosenthal wants to withdraw his motion. Mr. Rosenau, you're withdrawing or you're going to let it stand? Let it stand? All right, Mr. Rosenau's motion does stand. Mr. Clerk, can you tell us what we're going to vote on? Uh, we, Mr. Parks? Bifurcating and amending, or are we just bifurcating? Is Mr. Rosenau amending or bringing in a new ordinance? But he said amending. I just want to make sure we're clear. We're bifurcating and amending? That, that would require an, a new ordinance, sir. The bifurcation would require? Correct. I don't. It's already. Mr. City Attorney, can you clarify? There is some question. I don't, I, I don't know if I could uh, clarify the unclarifiable. Uh, Not the motion. My understanding was that a new, ord a new ordinance would be required to take out the matching, the trigger provision from the ordinance. Perhaps Mr. Mr. Rosenau could restate his uh, motion. Mr. Parks? Is that different from 11A and B? Yes. Yes. It, it, it would amend 11.1B, sir. So so there's an ordinance that uh, addresses 11 uh, 1A. There's uh, a second ordinance uh, f for Ms. Uh, Mr. Mr. Alarcon, point of order. Does uh, 1A uh, have the trigger provision in it? No. It does. So it's redundant, right? And 1B. So why don't I just withdraw the, the trigger uh, aspect of, uh, of 1B? I defer to the city attorney, but I believe that would still require a new ordinance to be drafted. Oh, forget it. The city attorney is ready to address something. <laughs> it appears. <laughs> Since we're all confused, does anyone have clarification? We're pulling triggers, we're not pulling triggers, we're amending, we're bifurcating. Mr. Weizar, jump in on this one. We're going to withhold it. Why do we even have to do any amendments today? Everybody keeps on coming up with other issues. There, there was an outstanding motion by Mr. Rosendahl, which we interpreted as a motion to amend the ordinance. Um, if, if that was an incorrect interpretation, if you perhaps Mr. Rosendahl could restate the... the Just with, I'm withdrawing it. Somebody else can put something else in. I'm off. Mr. Englander? Uh, before, just for point of clarification, before um, Mr. Rosendahl made the second on my, when I first put, pressed my button to speak, I did ask that we move to implement um, 1A, and I asked that we separate 1B, uh, which would then create the drafting of a new ordinance to come back next week because of the withhold originally from Mr. Huizar. So in terms of a point of clarification, um, I would like exactly what Mr. Rosendahl was asking, that the new ordinance be drafted and bifurcated and come back separately so we can implement it separately and vote on it separately, which is what I think is the cleanest way to do it. Well, it was the point of clarification. That was what I'd asked for originally when I first spoke. That, that would be a new request, and if it is uh, duly seconded, we can uh, address it. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can we move forward on a vote? or a withdrawal or something. Uh, Since all we're doing is Mr. Rosendahl's request has been withdrawn. 
uh, Mr. Englander has uh, essentially made that same request, and uh, without a second, uh, that matter would not be before your body at this point in time. And Mr. Cardenas asked that it be withdrawn, so our Withheld. Withheld. With, I'm sorry, withheld. Now our action, Mr. Clerk. Is there a vote required? I, I'm sorry. His motion. Mr. Mr. Cardinal seconded Mr. Englander's motion. Then, then that would uh, be before your body for uh, consideration at this point in time. Uh, what are we going to do, Mr. Clerk? We're we just going to continue it to Wednesday without any more debate? Or is there any other debate to continue? Mr. Alicon? I believe on a withhold, everything stops. And you can have debate, but you can't vote on it. And I challenge, uh, I challenge the city attorney to make a definitive determination of that. The, the items that are on the agenda as items 11 and 12, Mr. Cardenas withheld unanimous consent for those items. Those items all go over to August 10th for a second reading. So 11 and 12 continue to August 10th. No vote is required. That's the direction, Mr. Clerk and Mr. City Attorney? That's correct. Uh, All right. The, the motion could be re-entertained next, next week, uh, I'm, I'm sure, and, and treat it as a, treated as a so motion So at this point, week. the discussion is over. 11-12 going to August 10th. Uh, Mr. Clerk, Mr. Kikorian. Over for today, but I assume there will be a full debate as well when it is on August 10th, next week. next week. Thank you. Okay. We didn't want. Can I please be put on? Okay. Back. We didn't want to leave you out of it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, colleagues, thank you. On 11 and 12, Mr. Clerk, our next item, please. Mr. President, for clarification before we move on, those items will go over uh, next week for a second read. Yes. Very good. Uh, that brings council to item 15, called special for cards. Number 15, Arnold Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Arnold Sachs. Um, just after listening to this conversation that you had on items number 11 and 12, and I'm not sure if the holdup is due because of the people on the Supreme Court ruling, but or is it just because of the lack of action by the City Council? Some of this could have been addressed and should have been addressed when Councilwoman Wendy Gruel ran for seat the uh, controller's office, thereby opening up a position on the council for election with campaign and um, spending limit revisions. Then we had another election, and now we had, could have been addressed when Janice Hahn decided she wanted to run for lieutenant governor, maybe opening up a position then. Now she is in uh, Congress, which is their problem, but the fact that you failed to act gives volume to why there's so many tie-ups with other actions in the city and greatly increases my concerns about your actions you're going to take regarding the project as it was described that will affect the city for the next 50 years, and that's the downtown stadium. It's mind-boggling. Dean Searcy. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dean Searcy. I'm a uh, LA resident and a student, and uh, I'm here as an intern for California Common Cause. Um, I feel it's important that um, we focus on what a public financing system is actually trying to do. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to remove the influence of big money in elections, wealthy candidates. And um, what, we're, what we want to do is um, 
by just increasing the spending limits and the contribution limits, that doesn't reach what a public financing system is trying to do. So um, on item number 15, we urge that um, the council vote no. Thank you. Trent Lane. Hello again, uh, Trent Lang, uh, California Clean Money Campaign. Um, uh, item, item 15, we certainly believe uh, that the changes need to be made. The spending limits haven't been raised and contribution limits haven't been raised since 1990. Um, but these affect the public financing system and uh, we need to consider that we believe in a full package such as in item number 16 that Council Member Huizar has put forward that would address all the problems, all the changes that have happened since 1990 to make sure the system is responsive to constituents as well as being uh, 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 a strong and effective system. So we would urge that uh, that this item be considered with research at the same time by Ethics Commission, come back at the same time, um, uh, uh, so that all these things can be considered in one one package to see the best way to amend uh, the, the system. Um, I believe the Ethics Commission actually asked uh, to have this report be done by after the special election so we can take that data into account. Um, we, we would be uh, very much for that idea of waiting until uh, we have the results of the special election uh, so we can make the best combination of some of the ideas possibly in 15 and definitely uh, the comprehensive ideas in item 16. Thank you. Mr. Weiser, then Mr. Englander. This is uh, Mr. Engler's motion if he wants to speak first. Uh, my item is at number 16, which comes up next, which addresses some of the same issues. But I will ask that item 15 and 16 be continued till after the special election. The Ethics Commission uh, wrote a, a pretty um, well-reasoned uh, letter, uh, letter as to why uh, these items should be continued. There was no rush at this time. Uh, we could get more information with CD15. And I think it will behoove us all that we take our time in a more thoughtful manner as we move forward to, uh, to rewrite our laws on our matching funds. Mr. Englander? I'm okay with the timeline. I don't think they should be joined. But um, I just move that we move forward with the committee recommendation. Uh, uh, pardon me, sir. Uh, for clarification, this was submitted without recommendation uh, from the report. committee. Yes. A, a motion should we move, be. Just that we move the report. Correct. Move the recommendations contained on uh, today's agenda? That's correct. Very good. Yes, thank you. Mr. Weiser. Thank you. I wasn't aware that Mr. Englinder was going to move his item today, but uh, folks, uh, Measure H, which the voters approved, lifted the cap on our fund matching fund system. The idea was that once we lift the cap, that then we would go back and rewrite our rules and regulations on our matching fund system. Uh, that process, uh, I think, needs to be a thoughtful one. Item 15, which Mr. Englander has put forward, is going to jump the gun when, in fact, the Ethics Commission, the City Attorney, is going to come back to us with a report on how we should move forward in relooking at our laws. Whether we have the Supreme Court case or not, we would be doing that anyways. If we do this now, implement item number 15, I think it might create some unintended consequences with the future more comprehensive report that the Ethics Commission and the city attorney's office uh, it, it will, will come back to us. We may even have with, withdraw it or rewrite it, or uh, I think uh, it may even be moot. Uh, we, it may, we may move in a totally different direction. Uh, there's no need to do this at this time. There's plenty of time to, to look at this that will affect the elections in 2013, I think is the, the target date that we're looking at. So we have uh, oh, more, uh, a little over a year to look at this and, and really put some time and effort into it. Think about it. If we were just trying to rewrite it temporarily for CD15, everyone was confused. No one knew what we were talking about. We don't want that to happen again. We should take our time, do it in a thoughtful manner. This type of uh, uh, discussion needs to take place in a, a more relaxed environment in-depth environment in a committee and not here. So I ask that we vote no on item 15 and that, um, and that we uh, allow the Ethics Commission City Attorney's Office to, as they requested, give them more time to look at this. Mr. Englander. I just call for the question. Question has been called, colleagues. See no objection, calling the question. On this matter, colleagues, open the roll. Uh, 
Mr. President, Mr. pardon Weezer me. Mr. Weezer is up again. You I, don't think the it, I don't think everybody is in this room uh, for us to take a vote. Um, All right, Mr. Clerk, we need to make sure everyone's in the room. Should be uh, Mr. Alarcon, Mr. Cardis, Mr. Englander, Mr. Weezer, Mr. Kikorian, Mr. Parks, Ms. Perry, Mr. Reyes, Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Weston, and Mr. Zine. Those are the ones who should be here. And as I look around the room, I think some were uh, at the restroom facility. Is everyone else here? Ms. Perry? Could someone see where Ms. Perry is, please? All right. Well, the question was raised. Well, I think there's a, uh, a request from Mr. Weezer that he see the council member. And if we can have Ms. Perry come back into the room. Mr. Weezer, is everyone else here except Ms. Perry? There's Ms. Perry is here. Ms. Kikorian is here. So we're, we're voting on the matter. Mr. Parks, clarification? Mr. President, uh, for clarification, uh, the question was called. However, there's nobody uh, currently on the queue, uh, so a vote is not necessary. Uh, before you now uh, is the uh, Englander Krikorian motion, uh, the recommendations of the Englander Krikorian motion as uh, as uh, moved today by uh, Council uh, Member Englander and seconded by Council Member Cardenas. So that matter is now before us. Mr. Weezer? Point of order. Uh, it, and what will the motion do? Point of information. What will the information do? And the Ethics Commission has asked us to wait on looking at any of this. So what will it do? What are we voting on? What's the, what's the motion? Would you, would you like me to read the recommendations on the agenda? Yes, please. Uh, again, as, as stated on the agenda, recommendation number one, direct the City Ethics Commission the assistance of the, with the assistance of the Chief Legislative Analyst to provide the Council within 30 days a report on options to adjust campaign contribution and spending limits for all City offices from their 1990 value to their present day value according to the Consumer Price Index for the Los Angeles Long Beach Metropolitan Statistical Area beginning at the start of uh, fiscal year 2012-2013. Recommendation number two, instruct the City Ethics Commission to include in its report options to raise campaign contribution and spending limits and adjust all contribution and spending according to the CPI for the Los Angeles Long Beach Metropolitan Statistical Area at the start of every city fiscal year commencing with fiscal year 2012-2013 and to specify the new amounts of all CPI adjusted limits. Recommendation three, direct the CLA to assist the City Ethics Commission to provide the Council within 30 days a report with similar options for adjusting office holder committee contribution limits and spending limits. And recommendation number four, request the City Attorney report on all legal ramifications for adjusting campaign and office holder contribution and spending limits based on the above methodology. That's what we're voting on, colleagues. And now there's Mr. Parks and Mr. England are on the queue, but we did call the question. There was no opposition to that. So now we have more conversation. Mr. Parks? Or Mr. Englander? I just, I just want for clarification, when I again first started speaking, I said ethics asked for more time. I support the additional time frame. Start the report now, but you don't have to report back until another 60 days, so it's not tied to get it back in 30 days. I said that when I first started speaking. If I, for, if I need a, uh, a second on that, um, I believe I already, already had one and said that Cardenas, uh, Mr. Cardenas had supported that. The clerk acknowledged that, and then I called for the question. So I don't know what the debate is about. Just clarifying. I don't think there was a debate. Mr. Weezer, I wanted clarification okay. on what we were voting so, on. 
It was not a debate. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I will withdraw my. Uh, well, actually, I um, I'm fine with that. I there was I didn't hear a second for the amendment or that there was a uh, an amendment to include it for 60 days. So that that's fine. I, I I'm fine with that. That they'll come back together. And that, but I do want to note the commission had actually asked for more time, uh, but. If 60 days is what we're giving them, I apologize. I know you're overstretched, but that's what the council wants to do. Oh, Mr. Clerk, I think we have clarification. Now we're going to vote. Very good. Open the roll. Close the roll. Tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Thank you. Next item, please. That brings us to item number 16, called Special for Cards. Number 16. Mr. President, might I remind uh, the body again that this is a communication from the uh, Rules and Elections Committee that was submitted without recommendation. A motion is required. Mr. Lang, followed by Ms. Gilbert. Hi, Trent Lang, California Clean Money Campaign again. We're very happy to have this, this motion for grateful to uh, Councilmember Wezar for putting it forward to uh, implement the will of the voters in Measure H, uh, looking at the rules, the details of um, how the system should be to strengthen the system, to make it more uh, responsive to constituents. We think there are some great ideas in there, uh, like making, changing the qualifying, uh, uh, exploring changing the qualifying method to require some uh, a, a number of contributions from constituents, for example. Uh, we think that's a great idea so that uh, uh, the system is more responsive. Um, ideas like increasing the matching funds, especially for in-city and in-district residents so that the candidates are getting matching funds for the people who are paying for the system and not for people from outside the city or from New York or Florida as under the current, uh, the current system. So. Uh, we believe there are a number of good ideas here. Along in the package would be things like increasing the spending limits, which would be something that uh, uh, might make sense as long as the system is more responsive to constituents by these other sorts of changes uh, that are in the proposal, increasing the match, making the qualifying more, uh, more related. So this is something that uh, the, we believe that the, pu the public, the voters, were calling for, a strengthened system with their 75 percent vote in Measure H to, to make the system more responsive, allow more candidates to run. Uh, we uh, very much look forward to the report. Um, we agree with the, the Ethics Commission's idea of being able to look at the report possibly after the special election so that there's time to uh, really take that into account. Uh, thank you all. So a very strong yes on this motion. Robin Gilbert. Good morning. I'm a volunteer with the California Clean Money Campaign in the San Fernando Valley, working with other volunteers. And I first want to thank you very much for putting Measure H on the ballot. Voters really like it. They remember it. And that's, that's impressive to me. I am urging you to support Measure uh, on Item Number 16. We need to look at the overall picture. There's so many things that need to be looked at in regards to uh, public funding of campaigns to make it attractive, to make it work for candidates. There's been a lot of court decisions and changes, and we need to make our system responsive to that and work for it. We need, it, we need the ethics commissions to study this and make their suggestions. I'm listening to a lot of back and forth. We need this, we need that. And, but I think if the Ethics Commission looked at the big picture, they could give us the answers. Thank you. Kathy Feng. Good morning, Council. Kathy Fung with California Common Cause. We're strongly in support of item number 16, and we thank uh, Council Member Huizar and Rosendahl for making this motion. Um, we do support uh, the, the continuance of this because we think that there are a number of City Council members who want to be part of this discussion who aren't here today, but also because uh, with the District 15 election about to happen, um, we can see 
uh, depending on what the City Council votes on with regard to items 11 and 12, um, how some of those changes might play out. Uh, the Ethics Commission is going to be out uh, until September. They're not meeting until mid-September, so we think that it's important both for this item as well as item 15 that both uh, slow down and wait for the Ethics Commission to be able to look at what the impacts are going to be. Um, lastly, I would just say that um, with the Supreme Court decisions in Arizona, free, uh, uh, free Enterprise, and also Citizens United, uh, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said that uh, they, they do not think that systems should be in the pl position of trying to level the playing field. However, um, they do think that matching fund systems serve a legitimate purpose in terms of incentivizing participation and incentivizing voters to have a voice in elections. And so with regard to those two goals, we think that tinkering with one piece or another but not thinking about the matching fund system as a whole is problematic because you don't incentivize more participation when all you're doing is adjusting the sp spending limits without thinking about the relative levels of match or what the thresholds are for p candidates to participate in the matching fund system. We think that the proposal that's being brought up by Council Member Huizar is a smart approach and we would urge the Council Members to support that. Thank you. Joe Saidita. I'd like to thank all of you for your thoughtful approach to the issue, and particularly uh, Councilman Weizar. I've been involved in grassroots politics longer than I like to admit, and before many of you in this room were born. Uh, and I can, will always remember, and with it was a great deal of success, from the Peace Lake 68 to the, the bilateral nuclear weapons freeze, where we've got other states to do it, and it passed. And I, I uh, want to know, I want you to know that the excitement of that 75% vote really was a very special experience. The people have spoken, some of you have spoken, but I think you really need to listen to that. The people of Los Angeles have given you the message that they want this to be a good system, one that will work for good candidates, and I urge you all to vote for it when it comes back and to enjoy these discussions at your next meeting. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Weezer. I'd like to move the uh, motion as reported by committee. I understand it was a uh, committee of one, and that's why there's no recommendation. Thanks. Uh, is there a second for that? Second. Let me see. Second, Mr. Englander? Yeah. All right. Colleagues, open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Next item, please, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, that brings us to item number 19, called Special for Cards. Number 19, Arnold Sachs. One minute left, Mr. Sachs. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon again, Arnold Sachs. Part one of this item, you're going to take $120,000 from fiscal year 2010-11 to do a financial, a year-end financial status report. Part two of this item says you want to designate $180,000, excuse me, to conduct a financial status report for 2011-2012. So in essence, you're making a $60,000 increase in this contract with Strategic Treasurer. My question is, the CLA and the CAO's office just did uh, Treasury report on the LA Arena Land Company or the AEG's proposition to allow the city to get into a sharing of revenue. And how much did that cost? And the CLA and the CAO did a study for them. Why is the city now paying an outside agency to do a study for the city? Other matters before us, colleagues? Open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 11 ayes. Next item, please. Mr. President, that brings us to item 26. It's a matter scheduled for closed session. Number 26 is closed session. We will now 
secure the chambers and go into closed session. Sergeant Arms, can you please clear the chambers for closed session? investigating a series of bizarre and disturbing attacks that have left children in cities from coast to coast injured and fearing for their safety. 
As Global's Anna Gebauer tells us, the young victims were targeted simply because of the color of their hair. They better and while we begin with an eyewitness news exclusive disturbing video of a gay man being beaten in Queens. The individual was attacked uh, uh, simply uh, for his, his orientation and uh, we're just not going to tolerate it. The word hate is just unexcusable. It's a word that shouldn't be used and to hate somebody for the color of their skin is just not right. It creates fear among all of the community members. I think it's wrong how people discriminate against others just because of the way they prefer people, as in gays or just their skin color. It's wrong and something needs to be done. A hate crime is any criminal act directed against a person based on the victim's actual or perceived nationality, religion, sexual orientation, disability, gender, and especially race. Examples of hate crimes include acts which result in injury even if the injury is slight, threats of violence that look like they can be carried out, acts which result in property damage, any criminal act or attempted criminal act including property damage directed against public or private agencies. A suspect can spend up to one year in jail and if it's a felony it could either be between two and four years for a prison sentence. If you believe a hate crime has occurred or will occur, you are very much encouraged to contact the Los Angeles Police Department or the We Tip Hotline. Public cooperation is often essential in solving hate crimes. We Tip Hotline, 909-987-5005. Okay, we're back into open session. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, relative to item 26, there is a recommendation for settlement in the case entitled William Larkin versus City of Los Angeles for the amount of $825,000. That matter is now before you. On that matter, colleagues, open the roll. Close the roll, tablet the vote. 11 ayes. Next item, please. Mr. President, Council has motions for posting and referral. Post and referred. The desk is clear. Announcements, colleagues. Mr. Rosendahl? Yes. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to comment um, about the, the Congress going on recess and leaving the FAA in limbo. It doesn't impact us. The government is going to lose a billion dollars in airline tickets because lawmakers have left town for a month without resolving a partisan standoff over a bill to end the partial shutdown of the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. We already lost $200 million. It's going to be over for a billion. Also, 4,000 FAA employees are on furlough at the same time. I checked with our airport to see what impact it would have, but we, we have enough cash reserves to continue our modernization. But the second issue, which is just as angry, if not war, more, is the FAA has missed the August 1 deadline for implementing new rules that would keep fatigued pilots from flying planes, a delay that families of airplane crash victims blame on the influence of the airline industry. It's very disappointing, folks, to see the Congress go in recess, leaving things undone that affect us on the local level. Thank you, Mr. Rosenbaum. Mr. Reyes. I just wanted to uh, thank the communities throughout the city for National Night Out yesterday. Uh, there was a strong presence of many folks in Pico Union Westlake, the Northeast, and it was a great, great demonstration of support for our LA police officers, uh, folks who deal with security issues, especially those of us who str struggle with some of the uh, violence caused by the gangs in the, in, the, in the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Cardenas? I'd also like to echo that uh, sentiment. Uh, it was really, really wonderful to see 
all the families, especially the little children out there, a national night out throughout the city, and uh, to see all the wonderful organizations that volunteered to pull the various events together. There were thousands and thousands of volunteer hours and tens of thousands of people throughout the city that actually benefited from having a wonderful opportunity to meet their neighbors and to have some fun and to remind everybody that we have a lot of wonderful, safe, and fun neighborhoods throughout this tremendous city. So again, my thanks and gratitude go to all the volunteers and organizations who uh, donated hot dogs and time and all kinds of wonderful things to make it a fun and enjoyable gathering uh, at various spots around the city. Thank you. And Mr. Cardenas, I'll add that your representative did a fantastic job at the West Valley. A uh, lot of frame certificates made many, many people very pleased. So uh, we're very pleased to present those to members of the department. The community was a great event citywide. Mr. Parks? Just like to uh, ensure the community is aware that uh, in uh, Lamert Park, uh, there's going to be the uh, sixth annual New Orleans Cultural Festival on August 6th and 7th, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. in the Lamert Park Village Theater lot. Thank you, Mr. Parks. Uh, any other announcements, colleagues? I have two announcements. There's a public hearing this, e this afternoon, 3 o'clock, the village at Westfield, Topanga, Warner Center, Marriott, 21850 Oxnard Street, Woodland Hills, that again is going to be discussed in the EIR on the village plan, Topanga and Victory in Woodland Hills. And also at 6 o'clock tonight, off-site Audit Government Efficiency Committee meeting at West Los Angeles Municipal Building, 1645 Corinth Avenue, second floor in the district of Mr. Rosendahl. We will hand the, conduct our off-site meeting at that location this evening. Any other announcements? Mr. None. Mr. President, pardon me before moving on. Uh, there is a request from member to uh, send item 19 forthwith. Number uh, 19 forthwith. Just a point of order on your motion. I mean, that you're meeting tonight. Unfortunately, I can't be there because we have the ad hoc committee um, um, on AEG at the same time. We have a lot of evening meetings, day meetings, meetings right. on weekends. We're also looking forward to you guys coming. People from my district. Well, we will be there and uh, discussing those very serious issues. Mr. Corian? Send item number 22 forthwith, please. As 22 well. forthwith Thank from you. Mr. Corian. Uh, any adjourning motions, colleagues? Mr. Parks? Please stand. We have adjourning motions. Mr. Parks, adjourning motions, then Mr. Reyes. Mr. Parks, then Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd ask that we adjourn in memory of Lillian Brown. Uh, who was born in 1926, passed away July 30th, 2011. Uh, she attended uh, school in her hometown but had to quit to take care of her family. But later at the uh, ripe age of 70, she went back to school in 1996 and received her high school diploma. Uh, she was, uh, had to work for her family. She loved working with children. Uh, she also was a uh, volunteer in the city, Los Angeles City Hall for over 27 years. As a volunteer, she was referred to as Angelina and served the city of Los Angeles under Mayors Bradley, Reardon, and Viragosa. Lillian uh, volunteer work not only helped the elected officials of the city of LA, but children in Los Angeles as well. She served in Nancy Reagan's Foster Godparents program for 23 years. Her last service as a foster grandparent was at the Watts Learning Center, where she served for more than 10 years until her health declined. The faculty, staff, and students at the Watts Learning Center loved her very much. Uh, she was a favorite activity was uh, to go to church and also to shop. She loved being uh, with her family at gatherings. Last year, she hosted and organized uh, her very own 84th uh, birthday uh, ceremony. <laughs> During the celebration, she honored many people in the community. Uh, she was affectionately known as Madir uh, and uh, was the mother of eight children, although she adopted many children uh, throughout the community, and because of her loyal friendship, uh, she became a counselor and teacher and a confidant to many people. Uh, she was loved by all. She was survived by a host of family members. Funeral service to be held August the 6th at Prosperity uh, Missionary Baptist Church located at 6006 South Main at 11 a.m. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Reyes. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I'd like to adjourn in the memory of uh, firefighter Ray O'Connor. He was born January 21st, 1925 in Los Angeles. He attended Union Avenue Grammar School, Virgil Junior High School, and Belmont High School. Ray ran track, specializing in hurdles. Ray joined the Merchant Marines in World War II and graduated from the Alameda Naval Academy in 1942. He served in the South Pacific and was called up to serve in the U.S. Army during the Korean War, where he was assigned to a field artillery unit. In 1955, Ray joined the Los Angeles Fire Department. Ray O'Connor was a firefighter for the city of Los Angeles for 33 years, from 1955 to 1988. Following his probationary period, he was assigned to Fire Station 12 in Highland Park, where he remained his entire career. This is significant because it is rare for a firefighter, a police officer, or any employee to remain in one location for an entire career. Firefighter O'Connor did that for Highland Park for 33 years. Ray married Nancy Joy Curry in 1950. Nancy preceded Ray in death in 2008. This past Sunday, July 31st, at Fire Station 12 in Highland Park, the members of Fire Station 12 held a memorial service for Ray O'Connor. I'd like to ask all members to join me on this one. Thank you. All members, Mr. Reyes. May he rest in peace. Any other announcements, colleagues, uh, attorney motions? Seeing none. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. This completes our meeting for today. Our next meeting will be Friday. We will be in Van Nuys City Hall. Friday's meeting will be in Van Nuys City Hall. Have a good afternoon. Signing off from City Hall. Sorry.